Let's open our Bibles again to the book of Colossians. We move now to chapter 3. We're going to be looking in verses 1 through 17. Christianity is not about making mediocre people improved. Christianity is not about making okay people enhanced. Christianity is not about C-grade level people being turned into A-plus level people. It's not really even about making irreligious people into religious people. Christianity is not about making sick people better. Christianity is about making dead people alive. So the things that we have seen so far in Paul's letter to the Colossians present not just a a spiritual gloss to kind of put over our ordinary lives. The stuff that we are reading in this letter is about the raising of the dead. It's not about becoming improved people, but becoming new people. So take a look at Colossians 3 beginning in verse 1. So, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them, but now put away all the following. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. In Christ there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly beloved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also are to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity, and let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you for this word. All hail King Jesus. May this not just be the words from our mouth, but the cry of our heart, the allegiance of our souls. And we ask that you would do that for us by the power of your spirit. And in the name of Christ Jesus, amen. Uh, When I was your age, I I really struggled with a sense of uh, security in my Christian life, a a sense of assurance. I I lived in um, a time and attended a church that seemed also to kind of traffic in a lot of fear. It kind of played on my insecurity. It kind of played on my sense of uh, timidity and, and, and my sense of assurance. We were told that everything could kill us. Everything could give us a demon. There were certain toys we couldn't play with. I couldn't play with He-Man figures. You don't even know what He-Man is, but it was a big deal when I was your age. He-Man was the thing. And we couldn't play with He-Man because He-Man was new age. Couldn't watch the Smurfs. The Smurfs would give you a demon. Couldn't play with Rainbow Bright or Care Bears. They were new age. All the coolest toys would give us a demon. It was a climate of fear, even beyond those silly examples. And it had a devastating impact on my spiritual life. Because the truth is, I didn't really need any help being afraid. 
I didn't need any help thinking that my salvation was always up in the air, that I was always at risk spiritually. I carried around with me a sense of not being good enough, of of being rejected, of being disapproved of, of, of not fitting in, of not belonging. And I know a lot of young people struggle with those feelings, of course, but I I added all of that fear and all of that worry to my understanding of my faith, and it led me to being a very fearful and anxious Christian. The message of the good news is that sinners are saved on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross and out of the tomb. But for me, it seemed like my security, my assurance of salvation was vitally connected to what I had done or what I hadn't done. And when you realize you're constantly aware of your sin and you're constantly aware of your failings, trying to tie your assurance to your accomplishments or to your feelings is a great way to always feel insecure. So I would lie awake at night and I would stare at the ceiling and and I, and I would wonder, does God really love me? Am am I really a Christian? Can I really know that I'm actually saved? And I think one of the reasons I struggled with this question is because my understanding of Christianity was more about religious behavior than it was about resurrection life. And religion is, is, is fine, but true religion, biblical religion, is just the outer expression of an inward transformation. And when we spend all of our time focusing on the appearances, on the surface, we can actually miss out on the deep transforming work of God's Spirit and and what He does in our hearts and in our souls. When we spend all of our time focusing on the surface, we can begin to doubt our salvation because none of us can get to a place of perfect behavior. And what Paul presents in Colossians 3 isn't just people acting nice acting good. It's people who, by their belief in the gospel, have been utterly changed. They're not just having new behaviors. Their new beliefs have made them new people. Their insides have changed. Paul has said elsewhere that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Jesus himself said that if anyone wants to enter the kingdom of heaven, he must be born again. So we look now at this passage to see what that new birth, what that new life looks like. I have three characteristics of new life that I want to share with you. The first is this. The new life trusts in the eternal more than the earthly. The new life trusts in the eternal more than the earthly. Now, God has made the earthly good, and although it is broken and it's in need of restoration because of the fall of mankind, sin doesn't just affect us as human beings, it affects creation. It, uh, creation lies under a curse, Genesis 3 says. So there are good gifts, nevertheless, from God to be enjoyed on this earth, but these good gifts are not to be enjoyed purely for their own sake, but for the glory of the one who made them and gave them to us. So there's an if-then statement in Colossians 3.1 that's really key to how we understand our vision, our trust. Look at how Paul starts the train of thought. Verse 1, if you have been raised with Christ, if you have been raised with Christ, right? The then is implied. If you have been raised with Christ, then seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. If this is true of you, then this is how you would think and this is how you would act and this is how you would see the world around you. In other words, where is your hope? It's okay to have fun with things that are designed to be fun, to enjoy tasting good food and reading good books and watching good movies and playing in God's creation in a variety of ways, but do those things satisfy you the way that only God should satisfy you? Do you find your satisfaction in the eternal more than the earthly? The problem that you face, the challenge you face in having your vision shifted in this way to having the characteristic of new life to be satisfied or to put your trust more in what is eternal than what is earthly is that what is eternal is usually, most of the time, invisible. 
The things that are earthly are right in front of your face. They're the loudest voices you hear. And everyone else around you who does not enjoy new life thinks it's stupid to put your trust in things you cannot see. When I was in middle school, one of the things we had to be afraid of was nuclear war. And of course, this isn't a threat that has really you know, gone away in 2024, but in the mid-1980s, this We'll tell you how old I, you know, I am. Uh, in the mid-1980s, it was like a huge deal. Every day we wondered if we were going to be in a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. And it was a constant thing. It was all kinds of movies, and it was all over the news, and we would talk about it in class. And in fact, it was in a junior high school classroom that we began having this discussion one day about what would happen if there was a nuclear war with Russia. And I said, as part of my contribution to the class, that I wasn't afraid to die. And my teacher sent me to the counselor. <laughs> they thought I was depressed. They thought I was suicidal. And when I got to the counselor's office, I explained, no, I, I, if there's nuclear war, I'm not afraid to die because I believe that when I die, I'll, I'll go to heaven and be with Jesus. And so they discovered that I wasn't depressed. I wasn't even really saying that I wasn't afraid to die per se. It's normal to be afraid of dying. What they couldn't figure out, what, what felt jarring to them, was that I had a trust in something that I couldn't see. And they thought it strange to be a young person and have a spiritual interest. You know, it's normal to be afraid of dying, but what's not normal is giving no thought to what comes after. Most of your Friends, most of the people you see on a daily basis, they go through their whole day, their whole week, their whole month, whole years, maybe, sad to say, their whole lives, not even thinking about what comes after. Or maybe just a little passing thought about it. And Jesus himself said that there are worse things that can happen to us than dying. He said to his disciples, don't be afraid of him who can take your body. He says, be afraid of the one who can take your body and your soul. The second death, the, the spiritual death in hell that comes after physical death for people who reject Jesus Christ is, is far, far worse. Paul warns us about that in Colossians 3. Eternal damnation is far worse than the death of our body. And when we set our satisfaction, our hope on earthly things, only things we can see, we are in effect saying, I choose the heaven of earth now and the hell that is eternal later. In that middle school class, I wasn't really saying I wouldn't ever be afraid of dying. I was saying I wasn't afraid of what comes after. I was thinking about heaven. Paul says, verse 2, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Young people, do you think about your spiritual life outside of when it's time to go to youth group or come to a conference like this? Does it impact your thinking and feeling more than the world does? Does the reality of God impact how you process your life, the decisions you make, the relationships you get into, the behaviors that you get into patterns with? Or, or is God and his gospel just some kind of vague idea? He's just some kind of religious grandfather in the sky, and you literally only think about him when people like me bring him up. Now, all of us mess up in this. None of us is perfect. But this is simply about our ultimate hope. Where do you find your salvation, your justification. Is it in you? Is it in your grades? Is it in your money? Is it in your neighborhood, your strength, your abilities, your popularity, your, your feelings that change and on any given day, or is it in eternal things? The truth is all the earthly things in the world cannot satisfy the ache of our eternal souls. We were made for eternity, and we cannot fulfill our spiritual longing with temporary things. I saw some research this week that showed that out of 25 modernized countries, the United States is at the top by far in the rate of the use of antidepressant pharmaceuticals. Now, I know that there are likely multiple factors contributing to that statistic, 
but roughly 11% of the U.S. population is on antidepressants, compared to Korea at the bottom of the list at 1.3% of the population. The United States, where we take leisure seriously, where we do not lack for much of anything, where compared to the two-thirds world, even our lower class would be considered affluent and not lacking in basic needs. We have a lot of stuff. We have a lot of resources, and we lead the world in antidepressants. Maybe all the stuff that we think satisfies us, that we think will make us happy, that we think will make us feel whole, doesn't. Maybe we were made for so much more than money and popularity and sports and food and vacations and and even successful earthly achievements. Maybe, as St. Augustine once said, our hearts are made for God and they will be restless until they find their rest in Him. Are you satisfied in the eternal more than the earthly? If so, that's a characteristic of having a new mind, of having a new heart, a new life. Secondly, the new life hates sin more than its consequences. The new life hates sin more than its consequences. Just as it's normal to be afraid of dying, it's normal to hate the consequences of sin. Getting caught, getting punished, getting shamed, losing privileges, losing relationships. But everybody hates the consequences of sin, even people who don't believe in sin. You don't have to have a new heart. You don't have to have a new life. You don't have to love Jesus to hate the consequences of sin. Everybody hates that. But you do have to have a new nature. You have to have a new life to hate sin itself. So let me ask you, Because it's not enough to simply want to be free of guilt. Do you want to be free of sin? How would you know? Jared, how would I know? If it's not just the consequences I want to be rid of, but sin itself. Well, if you don't get caught, if you don't get found out, are you hurt? Are you convicted? Are you burdened? Are your efforts towards your sinful behaviors and patterns, not simply about trying to protect yourself from visibility, making sure nobody finds out, but are your efforts to make sure you don't engage in those practices. Verse 5, Therefore put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. You once walked in these things when you were living in them. But now, if you have been raised, if you have new life, put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, filthy language from your mouth. Don't lie to one another. Put off the old self. You've put on the practices of the new self. You're being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. Now, verse 10 is the key theological point in play here. Having put on the new self. It's kind of the centerpiece of my aim in this whole message, characteristics of the new life. If you're saved, you are being renewed by the Holy Spirit, Paul goes on to say. In another letter, Paul puts it this way. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. And this is simply Paul's way of explaining what happens in conversion and and getting saved. It's an elaboration on what Jesus has taught about the new birth. When you're born again, you're given a new nature. Some of you made professions of faith last night. For the first time, you said, I don't want to live the way that I have always lived. I don't want to be the person that I've always been. I want to have Christ as my Savior. I want Christ to be my Lord. I'm going to turn from my sin. I'm going to follow Him. And what happens when you do that? You're given a new heart. You're forgiven, yes, but also the Holy Spirit takes up residence in you and begins to direct your desires. You're being renewed, to use Paul's language. Your sinful nature is still there, unfortunately, But you have a new nature now that's conforming you more and more to the image of Christ. 
And so if that's true, it doesn't mean that you never sin, right? You don't become a perfect person. Christians won't be perfected until the Lord returns and we see him in glory and all sin is vanquished forever and ever. Amen. But what this does mean is that your natures are at war with each other. And your new nature is bothered by your old nature. We call this conviction. The Holy Spirit is convicting you of your sin. Do you want to, as Paul says in verse 5, put to death what is a part of your earthly nature? Or do you just not care? Do you just think it would be terrible if somebody found out about this sin? Because then I'd be in trouble. Or do you think, I wish I could be rid of this desire. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be this person anymore. I, I wish this, this shadow inside of me could just be torn out. I wish this burden on top of me would just be taken off. I, I want to be rid of sin, whether I'm found out about it or not. And in fact, those who want to be rid of sin, when they're found out, they are quick to repent. And in a way, they find even the consequences of their sin somehow a relief because it gets them out from the burden, the pressure of constantly trying to hide and protect their sinful nature. If you have that desire, not that you're sinless, but that you want to be, it's a good sign. You have a new nature. You belong to the God who hates sin and is coming in wrath against it. If you're convicted about your failure to honor God, it's a good sign that you belong to Him. Do you hate your sin more than its consequences? Thirdly and finally, the, the new life wants Jesus more than anything. The new life wants Jesus more than anything. The new life even wants Jesus more than heaven. I mean... To live with heaven in view is the highest aspiration that we could possibly have. To forsake any temporary satisfaction in this world for the surpassing satisfaction that is found in the glorious world to come is the hardest and yet it's the most pleasurable decision that you could ever make. I choose heaven over this world. That's kind of what point one is about. And yet, and yet, to long for a heaven where Jesus is just simply incidental is actually not to long for heaven at all. Everybody longs for a kind of heaven. And sometimes the way even Christians talk of heaven leaves the impression that it exists more for our glory than for Christ's. I can't wait to get to heaven and see what it's like to you know, play basketball without this body. You know, I can't wait to see what coffee tastes like in heaven. Chocolate. I can't wait to see what nature, I mean, the world is so beautiful. There's so many beautiful places. Imagine in heaven what those places will look like. We can't even fathom that. Like, this is all part of the riches I think we're going to receive in the new heavens and the new earth. And, and yet, the way the scriptures talk of heaven is not simply about a, a great, you know, majestic spiritual playground the way the scriptures talk about heaven puts Christ as the very center, as the focal point. In fact, the book of Revelation says the Lamb of God, that is Christ, will be the lamp of the new creation. We won't need a sun or moon anymore because his glory will illuminate everything. Christ is the end all, be all. This is how Paul puts it here. Verse 4, when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Yes, every tear will be wiped away. All brokenness will be restored. Every longing will be fulfilled. There will be an unending world of happiness and comfort. But the best part of heaven is not the best parts of earth illuminated, but the best man glorified. Do you long to see Jesus? Think of everything you want out of heaven. Make a list if you'd like. And probably most of it will be there. But if Christ is not at the top, is it still heaven? The point of the Christian life and the heart of the assurance that Christians can enjoy right now is Jesus. What do you see when you look to the end? Just you being happy? Or are you finally enjoying the embrace of the Savior you claim to walk with now? 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where we have this famous love passage. Near the end, Paul says this, For now we see through a glass dimly. But then, he says, we will see face to face. The goal that Paul holds out for us, the vision that he holds out for us as the the ultimate heavenly goal is to finally see Jesus. Are you a new person? If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you will be forever. Your life will be utterly new. This is what verses 11 through 17 are are all about. Verses 12 through 14 are about treating others in Christ-like ways, not because we want to be good religious people, but because we want others to see Jesus. Verse 15, the peace of Christ rules our hearts. Verse 16, the word of Christ dwells in us. Verse 17, by grace we do everything in the name of Christ. Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the most glorious, the most beautiful, the most powerful, the most precious person who has ever lived. And it's this person, God in the flesh, who came to earth to die that you might have new life. There is no other name under heaven that we are given by which we may be saved. And this Christ who went to a cross is worthy of your trust. And it is only by the grace of the good news of his death for you on the cross and his resurrection for you that you yourself can enjoy the death of the old self and new life of the new self. So long as you're looking only at yourself, at your performance, at your abilities, at your feelings, you will always struggle with assurance. But if you look to Christ, your heart can be captivated by the one who has performed perfectly on your behalf, who has done what you couldn't do and who has given you the eternal gift of himself. Sundar Singh was born in 1889 to a wealthy Indian family. His family were somewhat nominal followers of uh, the Sikh religion, S-I-K-H. You can do some research on that later. They were Sikhs. And Sundar hated Christians. In fact, there was a Christian school in his area that he was actually sent to, mainly because he could learn English there. And there were Christian missionaries who worked in that school, and Sundar and his friends would taunt and mock the Christian missionaries, and they would spit on the Christian missionaries. He hated Christians. And Sundar's mother died when he was a young man, and it plunged him into a deep, deep depression. He was depressed, he was despondent, he was plunged into despair, and he didn't know if he could go on living. He was so overcome with grief. And so one day, he went to lay down on railroad tracks to kill himself. And a a train never came, but Jesus did. Sundar Singh somehow laid down to die, and the Holy Spirit brought to mind some words that he had heard from those missionaries that he had mocked. The words of the gospel. And he went to lay down to die on the tracks and he got up a new person. And what he did is he decided he was going to spread this message of Christianity and he contextualized his message. He dressed up like a a Sikh holy man, which are called sadhu. So he wore the traditional garb of a sadhu, but instead of preaching the sort of uh, wisdom of the Sikh tradition, he preached the gospel and he preached Jesus, which of course made him now one of the missionaries that his friends and family hated, and he became uh, rejected by his family, and he was persecuted. He would essentially go village to village preaching Christ, and he was assaulted, and he was insulted, and in fact, um, we don't know what happened to him. He went up to preach the gospel up into some mountainous region, and he just disappeared. Nobody knows what happened to Sundar Singh. He likely was murdered by those he was seeking to bring the gospel to. But once, Sundar Singh was interviewed by a Hindu professor about his change in religion. And he was asked, what is it that you have found in Christianity that you didn't find in your old religion? And Sundar Singh said, I have found Christ. Oh yes, I know, said the confused professor, but what particular doctrine or, or principle have you found that you didn't have before? 
And Sundar Singh replied, the particular thing I have found is Christ's. There is no new life without Christ. If you yawn at this, you, you show the danger that you're in in this very moment. But if your heart is leaning in, if, if you know the Holy Spirit is prompting you to make this faith real, you want to be the new person. I urge you right now where you sit this very moment to repent of your sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ. He will not turn his back on you. Regardless of your feelings, regardless of your circumstances, believe it or not, regardless of your sin, he will not abandon or forsake you. He will not let you go. If you want this new life, you can have it. Jesus Christ does not say no to anyone who wants him. So take hold of his hand now because he, I promise you, is greater than everything and anything else. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of Christ Jesus. We don't deserve him or the grace that you give us through him, and yet you give, you give us your son freely. Father, I pray for every soul in this room that they would be strengthened by grace. For some, for the first time, they have not turned from their old life, their old self, to embrace the new self in your son. I pray you'd give them the grace to do that this very moment. And Father, for every precious saint in this room, whether they feel strong in their faith or weak in their faith, whether they know a lot about the Bible and Christianity or not so much, I pray that you would strengthen them from the inside out. Reassure them of your love for them and help us all to look to the cross, the ultimate proof that you love sinners like us. And it's in your son's name we pray these things in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen.